Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, sir, for giving me an opportunity to add my voice to the Indian National Congress's view of the union budget presented by the Honourable Finance Minister. Uh, Mr. Chairman, sir, this underwhelming budget has been a woefully missed opportunity. For after all, this was the government's chance to prove to the citizens of India after the colossal setback the BGP suffered in the recently concluded general election, that the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister have actually listened to the concerns of the people. But once again, they've let the people of India down. The budget is in many ways an emblem of this government's economic mismanagement and financial recklessness, made all the more worse by its divisive policies. This budget makes it abundantly clear that the BJP has run out of ideas. Rather than being a vision statement of the economic future of the country, this budget is an illustration, as has been pointed out by many, of their politics. Their priorities chiefly revolve around appeasing their two regional allies, forgetting there are 26 other states and eight union territories whose people have nothing to be happy about. But even out of those two, the people of Andhra Pradesh have much less, less reason to be happy at the supposed allocations made to their state in the budget. The budget only commits to arranging 15,000 crores towards the development of Amravati. This is not an allocation. It merely entails the facilitation of loans by the centre from multilateral development organisations to your state. Instead of amounting to a form of financial support for, uh, from the centre, this commitment will only add to Andhra's existing debt burden. The other promises made, of course, uh, are the very ones broken in the NDA's first term. One only hopes that another no-confidence motion will not again have to follow. Now, four other states have received the government's support for natural calamities, all NDA rule states, Bihar, Assam, Sikkim, and Uttarakhand. On the other hand, India alliance states find themselves cast out and ignored. Indeed, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, as well as my home state of Kerala, have time and again sought funds for natural calamities, from cyclones to rapid coastal erosion, and they've got none. Bihar received 26,000 crores for its highways, but Karnataka had sought and got nothing for the critical road infrastructure projects in Bangalore. For the government of India, it seems some states are more equal than others. Now, this inclination to bias is not limited to state allocations either. If one looks at the specific concessions on basic customs duty given to three cancer drugs, it turns out they're all made by the same pharmaceutical company. <laughs> Why were various other costly life-saving drugs being imported into the country overlooked for this exemption? On that subject, uh, Mr. Chair, I find it worrying that the government has completely disregarded the augmentation of existing healthcare infrastructure. In my own state of Kerala, many were hoping to hear a mention of the long-proposed aims in Kerala. Alas, even with the presence of two ministers of state from, my, from Kerala, the government has continued to disappoint us. Bias, Mr. Chairman, takes many forms. This budget fails to consider that in our country today, private investment is sputtering, consumption growth is slow, real rural wages are plummeting, overall wages are in decline, and demand for investment credit has collapsed. As a result, returns on labor are low, and so are returns on debt capital. Only equity and private profits are booming. The situation is perverse. Luxury watches, premium cars, and business class travel are reporting huge increases in sales and net profits. But the purchases of ordinary people have plunged. But SUV, SUV uh, sales are rising, and small car and two-wheeler sales are tanking. It is starkly clear why inequality in India today is said to be worse than during the British Raj. Even when all the flaws that beset a developing country, ill health, poor education, abysmal housing, poor sanitation, malnutrition, infant mortality, all linger in India. A multi-billionaire can preside over an obscenely extravagant wedding, reportedly spending 5,000 crores, while in the sprawling slums yeah. of the same yeah. city. Yeah. Most Indians struggle to survive on less than 200 rupees a day. This government does not frame its policies with those 200 rupees a day people in mind. Instead, it gives tax breaks 
to favoured capitalists and corporates in the name of boosting private investment. But in fact, but in fact this government's corporate tax cuts have meant a revenue loss over the last five years of an astronomical 8.7 lakh crore rupees foregone by the government. Who has this benefited, Mr. Chairman? Can you tell us where the jobs are, Madam Finance Minister? Where is the capital investment? While no one, Mr. Speaker, expected any better from this government, it's extraordinary that in India, individuals pay more direct tax than corporates. Budgeted figures of higher, <coughs> of higher direct taxes from individuals and lower from corporates will surprise voters and should shame the government. Perhaps they are ashamed since they've stopped even releasing detailed GST revenue collection data, allegedly because their GST collections are so high that they dare not reveal the extent to which the arm army is subsidizing this government through regular purchases that they pay GST on, while the government subsidizes a favored few. But once again, concealing data is a specialty of this government. Remember the PM Cares Fund. During the UPA years, Mr. Chairman, personal income tax was 21% of total tax collection. Corporate tax was 35%. Today, the share of corporate taxes out of total tax collection is the lowest level ever at just 26%, while the share of personal income tax and total tax collections has increased to 28%. But while this has gone on, private investment has nosedived from a peak of 35% of GDP under Dr. Manmohan Singh to below 29% during this government's 10 years of BJP rule. So the corporate tax cut has put over 8.7 lakh crores in the pockets of billionaires, while the middle class and the arm army continue to bear the weight of heavy taxation. In contrast, if the money were to be put into the hands of ordinary people, they would spend it in their local communities and on their own essentials and so stimulate the economy. It would be a matter of spending on roti kapra or makan rather than on, on the pockets of those whom the, who happen to support the BJP. So I want to point out to the Honourable Finance Minister, in her absence, of course, that one third of our population lives under 100 rupees a day. And if we are to have a budget that addresses their needs, we must pay attention to those crucial sectors of our economy that are conspicuous in their absence from this budget. My colleague Kumari Shelja has already addressed the emissions and agriculture, so in the interest of time, I won't touch that on farmers' welfare. But consider, for instance, that the word health is mentioned only four times in the speech. Indeed, Madam Minister did not even discuss health care at length. At a time in India when 55 million of our most vulnerable citizens are annually cast below the poverty line because of having to spend on health care, this budget offers nothing tangible for this vital sector. Was it really so long ago, Mr. Chairman, that COVID-19 rampaged through across the world, wreaking havoc and exposing our massively inadequate and ineffective healthcare sector? Yes, if one were to look at the budget, it would seem that the pandemic has been forgotten. For allocations to the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare have decreased as a share of the overall expenditure from 2.16% in 2019 to 1.9% in the budget. At the same time, the Ministry of Ayush has had an allocation nearly doubling. The fact is that India is just not spending enough on health. Brazil, Russia, China, South Africa, the other BRICS countries spend roughly 14 to 15 times more than us. Until recently, even Bhutan, Nepal, Maldives were outspending us. This year, the budget outlay for health has seen a minuscule rise, yet far from the aspiration of 5% of the GDP, the Modi government's health expenditure as a proportion of GDP remains stagnant, and we are even distant from spending the minimum 2.5% that was outlined by their government in the national health policy. We also must address the so-called missing middle. According to Niti Aayog, these are the people of no health insurance cover and are too well off to be eligible for the Aishman Bharat Yojana. When flagged in a 2021 uh, Niti Aayog report, the government said they would take notice of this, and yet here we are in 2024 with no health solution at all for this middle class. This is highly irresponsible and reflective of our government's inability to afford something as basic as health care insurance cover to some of our neediest citizens. Offering health insurance to employees at negotiated rates, 
reducing GST on health insurance premiums, offering such tax benefits as increased exemption limits under Section 80D of the Income Tax Act, could all have been ideas for the finance minister to make health insurance far more affordable and accessible, especially for the middle section, the missing middle of our population, which is growing, according to the government, but she has completely overlooked them. The truth is, Mr. Chairman, that even when it comes to a sector as indispensable as public health care, the mantra of the BJP, as with everything else, has been rebrand, not revamp. And so you've had India's health and wellness centers which need more funds and more staff to provide cost-effective treatment to ordinary Indians, regardless of their faith, being renamed Ayushman Arogya Mandirs, casting a secular institution of a secular nation into an overtly religious mold. But perhaps a certain constituency in Uttar Pradesh should have taught the BJP never again to exploit a mandir for scoring political goals. Yet rebranding is what this government has done for the last 10 years, but for me in calling it a name-changing government, not a game-changing government, as you know. But honestly, hearing the inflated claims of the ruling party after this week's budget and all the TV shows I had to appear on yesterday, I am reminded of a garage mechanic saying to the owner of a car, hum aapke brakes to thik nahi kar sake, isliye horn ki awaz ko badha diya. That's what the sarkar is doing. The brakes of the Indian economy have fallen out, but this government's horn keeps getting louder. Let's look at the, the targets announced for Make in India in its 10 years of, 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 of existence and underachievements. This government thinks honestly that rhetoric is a substitute for action. But if I may move to another sector of the economy which the budget barely pays any attention to, that's education, immensely critical to employment generation. For all the BJP's talk of upskilling youth and equipping them with the tools they need to procure jobs in today's intensely competitive job market, there was no mention in the budget speech of primary or higher education. We have a staggering three and a half million youngsters, 35 lakhs, dropped out of school in the last academic year for which there are records. And this is not just an indication of economic failure by the government kids having to join the informal workforce to support their families. But it's the future of India stepping away from the path of knowledge, Mr. Chairman. It's deeply unfortunate. And while leaving school may not be in these students' hands, getting them back to school is certainly in the government's hands. So it's a shame that access to quality and compulsory education has been wholly overlooked in this budget. Education has been allocated a miserly 1.2 lakh crore rupees, which is a 7% decrease from the revised estimated allocation of 23-24. More alarming is the fact that the allocation for the Department of School Education and Literacy as a share of the total budget outlay reduced from 3.16% in 2013-14, the last year that we were in government when the UPA was there, to just 1.53% in 24-25. And the combined allocations for both the departments have declined from 4.7% as a share of the total budget expenditure in our last year to 2.53% in your so far last year. Now, as a share of GDP, it's even worse. It's a horrifically low 0.36%. The government's own new education policy of 2020 recommends that the education budget should be 6% of GDP. Now, Mr. Chairman, if this Modi government cannot even meet the goals that they set for themselves, then what can we expect of them, Mr. Chairman? In continuance of their onslaught in education, by the way, the budget has slashed the funding for the UGC by 60%. Sir, my, my party has allocated 20 minutes to me, sir. So I have another six or seven to go. You are having 15, 15 members No, sir, I've been told 20, no. and I've prepared accordingly, please. Uh, but they've slashed, slashed the UGC budget by 60%. And fears do abound now that this will reduce the UGC to purely a regulatory agency, encourage universities to start more self-financing courses, creating an additional financial burden on students, and will also make more universities dependent on loans from the higher education financing agency, a complete transformation in our education environment. On top of that, in 2019, the government introduced a 4% education and health cess which is not a sustainable source of revenue for the government, but this CES has financed 70% of total educational expenditure after 2015. So that is another source of worry. 
So there's little to cheer on health and education. But should we welcome the government's belated recognition of the worst ever employment crisis in our country in history by their borrowing the Congress party's proposed apprenticeship scheme and renaming it? No. First, because the exaggerated claims of the government that it added 125 million jobs in its 10 years, including 47 million last year, are completely fake. They include unpaid labor, and even one hour's work a week has been counted as a job. Second, because they've dil diluted our scheme. We had proposed an apprenticeship, which would lead to jobs. They've reduced that to an internship, which is only assistance. They've only restricted to 500 top companies. We had it open-ended. We offered one lakh per person. They're offering only 5,000 rupees a month. And on top of that, they're saying 10% from CSR funds. CSR funds are meant for social welfare benefits and not for the companies to spend on themselves. So I have to say, on top of that, you have the fine print in the annexure that says that the participation in these, uh, in these companies, uh, of these companies is voluntary. I don't know how they're going to define the 500 top companies and how would these companies voluntarily shoulder the government's burden of creating an economy where there are enough jobs. The precedents are not encouraging. Can the government tell us what became of their 10 years of skill development efforts? How many of those trained have been placed in real jobs? What about the schemes for women? Why is female labor force participation at a record low today of 28%? But let's say, Mr. Bahamut, hardly after the BJP, we have heard our suggestion. It's a good thing. If it happens, it will be good for Bharat. But uh, it, 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 it's amusing to me that the BJP had to lose its majority in Parliament before they became receptive to effective suggestions from the opposition. <laughs> let me immodestly point out that it was I who, in the Lok Sabha on 10th of March 2016, asked the late Finance Minister, Sri Arun Jaitley, to reduce or remove angel tax in order to strengthen the startup ecosystem. And I'm glad to see that eight years later, a finance minister has heeded my words and abolished it. So, chalo, there I, durust I. But I have to say that the finance minister's rosy claims and FDI are believed, belied by facts. FDI as a ratio of GDP has in fact collapsed from an average 2% of GDP to 0.5% of GDP last year, the lowest in a decade. One big reason for stunted private investment is the heightened risk perception of the Indian economy. Foreign companies actually pulling money out of our country. Some $44.4 billion have been pulled out in 23-24. And actual FDI, that is investments minus what they take out, has fallen to $26 billion, which is a 37% drop according to RBI data and the lowest number since 2006-07 when the UPA was in power. Similarly, the government's disservice of removing indexation benefits under the long-term capital gains tax is unforgivable because countless members of the middle class worked tirelessly for years to be able to afford a house or make an investment in real estate to secure a pakka house for their families and it's no longer a viable investment because you no longer can index the appreciation of that value to inflation and you will pay a much larger sum as a result. In this example, a couple of minutes more, sir. In this example, we are looking at the government taking more taxes out of the pockets of the middle class, out of people who would, might even end up losing money in the course of buying and selling a property, which may be the only one that they can afford. Uh, so the real worry with all of this is that you're going to see a strong resurgence of cash transactions in purchases of property. It'll bring the real estate economy back into the deadly pool of black money. So, so much for na khaunga, na khane dunga. I must say, sir, the government keeps boasting of capex and infrastructure. But the fact is that, and it even says it'll create jobs in the tourism sector because of this. But the truth is, how can you create jobs or strengthen tourism when your refusal to reduce GST in hotels has made India amongst the costliest destinations you in just it, just salary, including, please. Sir, or indeed boost tourism when everything in the infrastructure we're seeing is collapsing. Terminal 1 in Delhi, the roof has collapsed. Rajkot in Jabalpur, the canopies have collapsed. Five bridges have fallen in Bihar last month. And Mumbai's Trans Harbour Link, which was inaugurated by the PM in January of this year, has developed cracks. So what the finance minister ought to do is allocate resources to fix our infrastructure rather than boasting about the tourists it will attract. 
I'm going to wrap up, sir, with just one sad comment further before I conclude, which is the accidents and the failure of the government to implement its own kavach that it's been talking about. We've had grisly and ghastly uh, uh, railway accidents, but the, the kavach system has only utilized less than half of the money allotted to it in the last budget and only 1% of the total amount of railway lines that are supposed to have been equipped with Kavach have been equipped. So this is pretty shameful and the budget has glossed over it. Nor did the Finance Minister mention Munrega, which has been mentioned by others, so I can just say in one sentence that demand keeps going up, but the Modi government keeps reducing its allocations to this. And it's far, the, the allocation they've requested now is far short of the amounts requested and required to meet the demands. On top of that, they've deleted job cards. 267% of more job cards have been deleted this year, and the new Aadhaar-based payment system has left 8 million active workers ineligible for payment. This is supposed to be something to help the rural poor. It's actually hurting them, sir. Let me conclude by saying that this budget is a do-nothing, claim-to-do-everything exercise. No matter how much the government ratchets up the mythic vision of a Vixit Bharat and its rhetoric, this is not a budget for a Vixit Bharat. It's a motley collection of schemes without an analytical framework or a coherent spending plan and no pathway to achieve the boasts and rhetoric of either Amrit Kaal or Vixit Bharat. The government is selling us Please a penthouse on. in a building whose foundations are shaky, whose canopy has collapsed, whose lift shaft is yet to be installed, and whose workers are starving. The budget lacks originality, ambition, strategy, we get no answers to the employment puzzle. We get no <coughs> solutions to education and health. And we don't engage with any of the crises of investment I've outlined today. The budget that India needs and India deserves is much more than a statement of solidarity with the ruling party's political Please. allies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Mehatab. Honorable Member Mehatab.